real guy who knows what's going on in this movie. Yeah. Uh, yes, welcome, gentlemen. It is so exciting to have you all here. Okay, so first things first, I am going to ask you guys an individual question about something other than children of corn. Uh -oh. And then, in some cases, and then I will turn it over to the audience to see if they have any. So make sure you think of something good. Now, I know the sound is going in and out. We're just going to do the best we can, okay? They're working on it, all right? I know. It's annoying. Okay, first things first. Courtney. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Okay, welcome. Now, I was so very excited to see you on our docket because I really, really loved you in Diagnosis Murder. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. Do you have any stories about working on that show? Because that was an amazing performance and amazing character as well. Sure, so um, if you didn't see the character, it was very challenging. So he was paralyzed on one side and pretending to have cerebral palsy on the other side. I had like a week to prepare that. So that was really challenging. So I had to really stay in character because I couldn't get in and out that easy. So while I'm trying to do that, Dick Van Dyke is running around singing show tunes <laughs> and acting like a complete jerk. So I could not wait till when my character finally breaks character and yells in his face. And uh, I did so, and he was just like, his hair was blowing back. So that's my Dick Van Dyke story. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> five, five, three. Yeah, hold on, I'm like, yeah, he's like, ha, ah, ha, 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 tell the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That is exactly, I'm a Broadway nerd, so that's exactly the kind of Dick Van Dyke story I wish for. Yes, yes. Fritz, I, I have not seen this. I am curious about it. Uh, you did two shorts called, uh, one called 12 Promises, Rewards of Recovery, and is there life after we have the recovery? Can you tell us about that? Okay. I think it's an on or off. Did I mess it up? It's on. But it's on. It's no, just... Hold it up close. I'm not a microphone person. I'm just a loud mouth son of a bitch, so I don't use it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can speak in the back of the room anyway. Um, in, in, in my life, uh, I have a special uh, place for recovery. Not that I've gone through that process, but my family suffers from some um, alcoholism. And so I was approached to help... Uh, group to make a product, a series of products for teenagers, from teenagers who have gone through programs of recovery and how that has changed their lives. And now that they are in uh, a place that's better for them, they can speak about it more directly to other teens, as opposed to adults talking to teens, which never seems to work. So I, I threw myself into both of those. Um, they were for kind of the Betty Ford world. They're very straightforward kids kind of discussions from, um, I guess they're late 20s kids who had a very difficult uh, teenage years. So it was, it's, it's not horror, it's having experienced horror and now <laughs> that's yeah. that something better. So that's what it was all about. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. Good. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm in recovery. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in recovery. If anyone else is, feel free to come up and talk to me. I appreciate your service to our our world, our tribe. That's beautiful. Yeah. It's a disease, but there is a treatment for it. But you gotta want to do it. You gotta want it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. Okay, you know, as much as I would just love to talk to you about young writers, I'm going to talk to you instead about something the audience wants to hear about, which is Richard of Living. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you tell us about that experience? Well, I mean, that's a huge thing. That, you know, Dan O'Bannon is O'Bannon is a good genius. Yes. And he came up with this script, and he auditioned us for a long each one of us for a long time, and then we had these rehearsals where he had got to feel us out, you know, to see who matched with who, and you know, it took us. It was a long process. He took his time, but I must admit, I did not know really what was going on. You know, he had this vision that it was a comedy punk rock zombies. And, I, I, you know, my character really is just kind of scared and wet the whole time, trying to pick up a chick that doesn't want to have nothing to do with it. And nobody likes it. It wasn't the funnest set in the world for me. But when I saw the movie, I was blown away. I mean, as everybody was, it was like, what is this? So he really was on something, and I am 
just great. Like uh, I, I matched what he was looking for, and I got to be in it because I'm talking about it right now, 40 years later. Next year's our 40-year anniversary, and it's a really interesting, funny, original movie. The first comedy zombie punk rock, you know, zombie. Zombie. <laughs> yeah. And Mr. Freeman, last but definitely not least, Children of Court adjacent. I really love Six Six Six. Wow. Like so much, and I didn't expect you. I went in with another dance sequel, but it was really good. Of course, you wrote it and were in it and had so much to do with it. How did you think of that? Like, what was the process? Um, I, first, my writing partner was also my first cousin, and we're both from the south side of Chicago, Blue Island. Ooh, where are you? Blue Island. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, uh, moved that way. But, um, so we had the idea, of, right after Children of Corn came out, to do a sequel, you know, have Isaac come back. And um, they, nothing happened, and finally number two came out like nine years later, and then three, four, five, and then we just went in and pitched. And by then, Dimension Films uh, with Miramax owned the rights, and we got it pitched. They're like, this, gee, this is a no-brainer. We were running out of ideas. so. And I said, this is number six, so we got to do 666. Um, and they said at first, uh, write whatever you want. Take, take your time. So we wrote, I'm just going to do this. You know? So I'm going to just talk loud because I'm a theater trained actor. <laughs> <laughs> this is very good enough. So uh, we wrote a huge thing. with like, uh, start off with a mental hospital. Courtney was there as, as Malachi in a wheelchair all gnarled up and burned and from the fire at the end. And then I was like taking over the world and the huge explosions and it was just insane. insanity. So we turned the script in and they're like, we cannot do this. <laughs> just a little bunch of movie. Direct it to the What are you talking about? Like, well, they think we're really wasting three weeks of our lives. And then they said, okay, go away. We've got weeks and weeks to write it. Um, you know, and we'll get back to you. And of course, we went on to do other things, other writing projects. And then all of a sudden they call us and like, oh my gosh, we've got it. The corner is green and turning brown now. We have to shoot in a week. So, like, so we cranked out the script, um, went through some wacky meetings with some really scary bad directors. And then finally they found Paris Scotland, who did The Crow and a lot of other amazing things. She's just brilliant. And she helped us shape up the script a little bit more. And then uh, we got Stacy Keach to be in there. Like, they also said, okay, this is what we can afford. We can afford you to chop a girl in half. You can afford you to electrocute Stacy Keach. I think they gave us a list of what they could afford, a low, low budget. Uh, but it, it turned out better than I thought. So it was just a, a fun experience. I really enjoyed it, and I wasn't expecting to. Okay. I just went in to watch it and I'm like, oh, okay, okay. We got Nancy Allen too. Yes, it was. It was. It had a great cast. It was well written. It was. It was fun and a good time. So yeah, if you haven't, I encourage people to watch it. Yes. Yes, and Carrie Scotland really did a great job casting all the parts. Mm -hmm. was really and of good. course, you were in it, which was awesome. Have you returned? Yes, please. I love a good callback. Right. <laughs> right. But they also said. We can't afford Courtney, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> my Courtney. <laughs> okay, do we have any audience questions right now? Are y'all shy? I guess. For Chris, was there any sequence that the studio nixed that you really want to do, or was there a sequence that was extra troublesome for you in the finished product? Oh, no, no, the whole film was troublesome. <laughs> these clowns made things really good. Here's how it worked, to, to be very honest and transparent. I was making television commercials at the time and was offered the opportunity to make a feature film and jumped at it with my producer partner in the television commercial, Terry Kirby, who produced the film. And so we took it on as a short-term television commercial production, which means we start today, we find our locations, we get the cast, we organize props and all the necessary resources. And we make the film with our friends and then we edit and so forth. Um, so there wasn't anything outside of just making up things on the day, like the monster or how to block the scenes, which I had no idea how to do until we got to the location. Um, I think the most difficult problem, John expressed it with the idea of corn dying, was when my partner Terry and I looked at the cornfields around the United States 
and we saw what Iowa offered in July. Okay, that sounds wonderful. We can go to this hotel, we can go here and have, but we're not farmers. We're a bunch of schmucks from the city. So we go back in September, oh, this stuff dies. You know? So that was the problem, painting the corn, using fish line to hold it up so it wouldn't fall over, fighting nature. Um, and there were sides of the street that were um, fallow and other sides of the street that had crops and we would just figure out literally on the morning when we would shoot. That was the hard part, I think. The rest was just fun. These guys were great. It was just a lot of fun. Any other questions? Don't be shy. No? Okay. I will continue on. I would like to ask, ask each of you about your acting journey. How did you get involved in this craft? For you, your directing journey as well. Uh, so I, I, according to my father, at six years old, I declared I was going to be an actor. I don't remember that, but that's what he tells me. My memory is uh, I was in this after school program with all the tough kids at school, the, all the broken homes and things like that. And we had this tough lady named Miss Gardner who would get us to do theater. And she, the craziest thing is she got the toughest guy in school. We did a play with everybody in drag. The toughest guy in school was the lead in drag. I don't know how she, how she pulled that off. But the first thing we did was uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. It started out as a dwarf, and then I ended up having to be the prince. I didn't really want to be the prince. I didn't want to kiss a girl. I was like 10 years old. But when I kissed her and the crowd applauded, I was hooked. I was it. <laughs> That's how I became an actor. What about you and directing? Oh, I'm sorry. I was paying attention. I was in the story. Um, it was a good story. It was a good story, you know? And I must say, to um, Courtney's um, experiences, I met Courtney in one of the first films you did, right? What, Noir? Yeah. Yeah, it's first film. And it was your acting instructor, Virgil Fry, yes. to kind of organize it. And Virgil was in Easy Rider, right? Yes. And a few others. And so here comes some somebody saying, this young man is somebody you should meet and so forth. And that kind of organized it. And you know, Virgil was wonderful. But um, making films, I had made television commercials. I, after leaving, graduating from university, I went to Los Angeles with this idea that I'm going to change the world and make films and talk to films to everybody. And got a job running errands for $35 a day and thought I was a filmmaker. And when I went back the second day, because I thought I was hired full time for $35 a day, they told me, you idiot, we just hired you for the day, go home. So I pawned the snow tires in the trunk of my car so I could get some hamburger money. And then just kept going back and I got these jobs to run errands in television commercials, which then taught me how to really make film. I was around a lot of really wonderful filmmakers who, like Caleb Deschanel, who's top American cinematographer today, and a lot of other producers and, and people who at the time, late 70s, were all making commercials. And then, as I mentioned, I started my own company making commercials. Somebody came forward and said, would you like to do any of these films? And since I was saying, oh, this is good tasting tuna, I could direct a feature film, and that's what propelled me. <laughs> I knew how to make things look nice, and that was it. Wow. And then I continued, and then I really learned how to uh, direct film after that. I mean, I really learned how this mechanism works, and what it's all about. Uh, I was uh, in high school. I was uh, on the wrestling team, and I was also doing the musical theater, the plays that go on in high school. And I was having way more fun doing the plays than I was doing the wrestling team. And I remember mm -hmm. your senior year, it was time to I had to make a choice because you could do one or the other in my high school. I was with my dad and a couple other wrestlers in the back and we were going into you know, our next year high school and the wrestler next to me, Ed Cost, goes, John, aren't you excited? You know, we're gonna start our wrestling. We're gonna go varsity this year. Aren't you ex excited? And I'm like, I'm not gonna wrestle this year. And it was just silent in the car. <laughs> I could see my dad just kind of tense up and this other macho dad that was with him was kind of just Quiet. They're driving, we're in the back. And he goes, why not? And I'm like, well, you know that feeling when you're wrestling and you pin your opponent, and it's as good as you can do. It's over, you've won, but you, you've done this. You can't do any better than that. And you're standing there, you're so excited, the adrenaline. He goes, yeah, yeah, I love that feeling, that's why I do it. And I go, yeah. I get that feeling every time I walk on the stage. Ooh. Just quiet. I can't even believe I said I was like, oh, that was great. And my dad, I could just see him relax. 
<laughs> just like what you did. Yeah. So, you know, as a father, answer. you know. Yeah. He was just happy for me, but you know, he didn't understand it or anything. I went, to, I, I, I didn't start acting, and I went to college. I looked at, I studied acting in college. When I graduated college, I did some plays in LA, and I got an agent, and he introduced me to Linda, Francis, and Jeff Greenberg, and Children of the Corn was up, and he goes, you should do this movie. It's a small part, but it's a good part. You've never worked before with Cameron. You're going to do another movie in Pontiac, Illinois, called Grand View USA after that, and you get some experience. And, and it was the smartest thing, because I'm not, no one's talking about the movie I did after that, <laughs> that, you know, I thought was gonna change the world. Right. Yeah, right, yeah, but uh, we're still talking about Children of the Corn, so thanks, Chris. Yeah, I'm really happy about it, thanks. <laughs> um, surprisingly, I was very shy in grammar school. No. <laughs> yes. Um, and then, I think I went to Catholic grammar school for the South Suburbs. Uh, again, blew out of the park for me. And in eighth grade, I think the nuns wanted to encourage me to sort of blossom. So they made me president of the library club, president of student council, and then asked me to write a play. So I wrote a play about illiteracy. And I had the idea of all these characters from famous books would come out of the books and help the two main kids. One was dyslexic and then learn how to read. And I was hooked in, so I wrote it, directed it, starred in it. And then again, the applause at the end. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they like me! And so I just, my, my cousin who later became my writing partner, we went to high school together, uh, and I was just like, we were joining drama club from day one, and then as soon as I turned 16 and got my driver's license, I was doing theater wherever, 30 minutes after drive to. I knew I wanted to major in theater, and I mean, it's just, so insane to think that I only applied to one college. Now, people <laughs> tell me, oh, my kids you applied to 15 colleges. I just did one, University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana, is where I wanted to go. I got in, and I did my four years. In the fourth year, they had acting for the camera. And back then, in the early 80s, there was like these big monster cameras, 33 quarter inch tapes that, that pop up the machine. But it was great training. And then I did some standing work. I uh, was uh, standing for Jake Fonda's kids in a TV movie, um, Dollmaker, uh, in Chicago, because I wanted on set experience. And then I just knew I wanted to move out to LA because I was you know, 23, looking 14, 13. Um, and I got an agent the first day, and a couple weeks later, um, I got cast actually first in an Atari commercial, Star Trek Atari, the Atari game. And I went to the set, and they started cutting my hair. I'm like, no, 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 I just got to chill in the corn. I'm going to the Midwest next week. You have to play a lead in this movie. I can't have this weird haircut. Because I, I was a young Vulcan. They did the whole Vulcan haircut. And then the guy who did Leonard Nimoy's makeup did my ear makeup. And, but it was, and then I got to the set a week later in Iowa, and Brinks and the producers looked at my hair and go, that's cool. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> And then from there, it just blossomed and blossomed. It was just, the bug was here. For John, uh, coming back Which to the island after oh. you did your uh, Isaac character, did anybody approach you in your hometown or say anything for Oh, yeah. There's a, a, a local theater uh, that I did a lot of plays, you know, growing up. And they uh, they wanted, you know, I came back and visited everybody that I knew that was still there, you know, the director, uh, Dan Flynn. Who we nicknamed Dam Twin, Dam Twin, so skinny. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was really cool. And then my mom still, her parents, if they're not with us any longer, but she would always cut out, uh, like, you are a trivia question at the local pizza place. And, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my dad had a TV store that my oldest brother took over back there. Uh, my people, some of my brothers are coming Sunday to the show. It's their first convention, they're gonna be freaked out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it's always cool. And, but my mom sent me a, a, look, a clipping from the local paper and said, oh, John Franklin arrived in limousine and went to the community theater, showcase theater, to visit everybody, and they were all like, I never had a limo. <laughs> but it was it's always fun, it was really cool. Part of or to film? Um, 
Well, the first scene when I cut out of the corner um, was the first scene we actually did, and they did this really great prank to Linda Francis when uh, she thinks the kid's gonna come out at her, but they really snuck the kid underneath and scared the hell out of her. And it was still to this day the best prank. I, I sort of assumed that's how all film went from that point on, that everything was a prank. Because <laughs> that's how we started. Um, I'd say that in the scene where I say to her, uh, we want to give you peace. It's probably my favorite line because it, it taught me less is more. That's not, that's not, that's not, that's not. I think, uh, yeah, it's a good question because I don't think about what's the most memorable of any of the things I've been able to be part of. But I think chopping the man's fingers off and then dying to me was really cool. And I, and I say that because as we prepared and thought about what we could do to be a group of terrorist children who would you know, dissolve the, or just destroy adults, I sat in a room with about eight adults, same people, and we talked about the most heinous things you could do to another human being. And no one was shocked. I mean, we were talking about, we could put his hand in a garbage disposal. No, that's not good enough. How about if we get uh, you know around their neck with barbed wire and you know, it just kept thinking, we're adults, and this is just awful thinking. And somewhere, I got an idea. Let's chop his fingers off in a meat slice. Oh, that's cool. And so I kind of embraced that, and it was kind of wrong. But it turned out to be really nice today. So it's me as well. No one got hurt. No animals were hurt in the making of that. Uh, it was my first film. Every, every scene was awesome for me. I only had only only two scenes in the movie. Carving the pentagram in my chest. I just remember, uh, you know, they were explaining the night how it was going to work, the practical ladies thing, and the guys pumping the blood. And you know, you got like 45 minutes, John. I just remember about 45 minutes. Okay, just going to the other room and doing sit ups and push ups and sit ups and push ups. The Bridget comes back in and goes, My God, I've never. I've never met an actor that's always doing sit-ups and push-ups in my life before like you. And I'm like, dude, I had my shirt off my first movie ever in like 10 minutes. <laughs> he was like, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, you know, the other scene was when I go into the cornfield, and I got to say, that was the most magnificent feeling. That's when I really realized acting is, the, for me, like the greatest thing, because it was night, our, our breath is coming out, they had blue lights, there's kids looking up at me, I'm going to sacrifice myself. And I just felt power and, and greatness in that moment of uh, supreme, the supreme sacrifice. And I was like, I am into this. So, <laughs> and, and I love this practical set. It's not a green room, you know? It's at night in the cornfield, and it was gnarly and fun. But I got to interrupt, John. I just got yep. to add to that, when he marched into the cornfield and pledged his allegiance to the ultimate, you know, he who walks, and come get me, Lord, come get me. He was off of the camera in the cornfield in about five steps, but he kept yelling that, and us are around the camera, he said, someone tell me to shut up, it's over. He <laughs> said, no one out there to tell him it's a cut. He just cut. kept walking to Omaha. I was the cut, right? I live, I live between action and cut. If I don't hear cut, fuck, oh and, and everybody's in the movie with me. <laughs> Before I step in my favorite I have, fans and even friends that come up and say, we saw fingers flying out from that meat cutter. No, no, no. You see the blood splatter on the kid with the strawberry No, But there are people with that will say, That's the best kind of effect, the one that they can think is on. Yep. Um, again, it was my, big, my first movie, too. Um, and my very first day of work was that big pre scene. So I was just so nervous that you gotta walk around and hit marks so they put a little tape on the corner makes that you gotta stop here and there. And I just kept doing it and they're like, oh man, he's one tape breaking. <laughs> so that was nice to hear. But watching the movie for the first time, um, they had a special screening uh, with Linda Hamilton, Peter Horton, and me, just this one of us was gonna go do the national uh, PR tour. tour. Um, I didn't get there, but, <laughs> but watching it, uh, just seeing that opening scene with me looking in the window, giving that go to give her the message that I'm getting cold chills now, and, the, and then watching again another scene with the little kids where I just kind of take her chin and go like that, like, ah, 
<laughs> so just, it's very powerful. And again, as Courtney said, less is more. So just doing subtle things. I have no line from that opening massacres cafe scene. Or difficult scene. The fight scene at the end. It was super cold, and these guys weren't nice enough to dig up the dirt or anything. I learned a valuable lesson there. I would never do stunts like that again <laughs> without making it. It was cold and it was hard. And so, and Peter Harden and I went at it pretty good. Um, that, that was it. <laughs> you know, in the end of the, in the, end of the film, um, after he gets beaten up and destroyed, and then John comes back and chokes him, and they go off. There's a massive explosion, and oh, yeah. that we we worked on thinking we would do the explosion in one evening, and that would be our day's work. And we had about three or five cameras organized, and the way the explosion works is a, a cylinder, uh, a, a hole that's cylindrical, is maybe ten feet deep, dug in the ground, and then trash bags filled with 50 gallons of gasoline are placed inside, and that's ignited. And so imagine the, the, the dirt as a muzzle on a barrel of a gun, and it just shoots everything straight up. It's, you know, it's physics, it's great. So the idea was, we'll do two of those, and then we'll superimpose the two pictures together. If the camera does not move, then it will give us absolute registration, one image over the other, and the background will be perfectly matched, and you'll see two fireballs. It'll be bigger than hell. Oh, fantastic, 10-story fireball. It was so cold, the guys were drinking peach schnapps. <laughs> so they didn't care about moving the cameras. They just spun things around, and the guy that was loading the gasoline had too much peach schnapps. So things just didn't work out, so we had to animate that stuff. So the last thing was like, you know, I used to have hair. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, dangerous? We're, I mean, we're also like involved the, in the The story. most dangerous thing was that night after, when I go into the cornfield and nobody yells cut. And I'm walking, I don't know where I'm going. I'm out in the cornfield, I'm looking for the monster to take me. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to the knife, then send a PA to the game. I'm like, oh, no, yeah. Oh, it's scary. It's really scary. <laughs> Um, peach snaps, I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the most difficult, difficult scene for me was up on the cross, that after Courtney had put me up there. Uh, because it was late at night, it was like 2, 3 in the morning, everybody was gone, no other actors, there was just me, Ritz, a, a DP, the director of photography, maybe one or two other crew members. And they kept lowering me in between takes so that they could throw them, you know, furniture blanket on me, because it was freaking. And I just had that little shirt on, Isaac shirt. Uh, and then finally I just said, stop, just leave me up there, move the camera, just keep going, keep going. And whatever five crew members were there were just like, yeah, thank you, thank you. We gotta go home too. You suffer. You gotta suffer. <laughs> you survived just, Iowa, which is a feat in itself. Um, do you have any stories about your time in Iowa? Did you get a lot of cornfields? Uh, I gotta tell you a story. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to hog anything here. As a company, because that's what we call ourselves, we come in and we are basically gypsies. We all live in a hotel, we all eat together, we all befriend one another, and we are a tribe. But it, and this is making motion pictures. And in doing this particular film, to get the background atmosphere extras, we joined with a local Sioux City theater group who got a lot of people together. And then we had a fundraiser one night which was a gambling night, a casino night. Oh please, film people, come to our casino night. Well, you don't invite Hollywood sharks to a casino <laughs> night if you want to make any money. And all the people on the crew, they were just taking these guys for a fortune. <laughs> there was no giving back. I remember that saying, leave some money on the table, you're supposed to contribute. No, 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 I'm like, I got a bet, I'm not $500. I'm gonna help these guys. I was telling uh, someone earlier at my table that we stayed at the Holland Johnson's. They actually asked one crew member to get out of their room so they could shoot the birthday cupcake scene with Peter and uh, Linda. Uh, but the women at the front desk were so sweet and kind and wonderful. It was just down to earth, down to earth people. And we actually, and I cried too, because we were doing you know, three to six weeks. 
and we all were crying to say goodbye. Um, we knew we'd never see each other probably again, but they were just really good down to earth people, and all the kids were just so nice. Uh, Courtney and I did a convention a few years ago in Atumpna, Iowa, and uh, one of the girls in the film, now a woman, Peggy, uh, and her husband came to visit us, and we all had a drink afterwards. It was just cool to see them. Next question. <laughs> okay, yes. For John, do you have any interesting stories on Adam's family? There you go. Sure. Um, <laughs> I have a good audition story, if you want to hear that. Um, they brought me in, my agent said, they just cranked out like Beverly Hillbillies and some other ones. So my agent said, you got an audition for the Adam's family. I'm like, oh God, another, cranking out another TV show. So I go into the audition, I got the script, and it just said, ooh, ooh, deliver and leap. I'm like, okay. But I walk in, and I give you sign in, and stuff, and there's always a receptionist there, and I, and I should not have said this, but she's, I said, oh boy, another old 60s TV series made into a movie. And she's like, well, we've got Angelica Houston, Raul Julia, Christopher Lloyd, I'm like, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> so I went in, and the uh, first audition, uh, they were just like, can you dance? Because we wanted to have, so I grabbed the assistant casting director and we're pole playing and just waltzing around the room and they're, they're laughing and laughing and stuff like that. And then I had a dream the night before of doing the voice. So I, they were like, thank you, thank you. you know, and, and they said, you can leave. I said, no, no, I have to prove to you that I am a Shakespearean trained actor and I want to do a monologue from Hamlet for you. And they're like, oh my god, this guy's nuts. Let's yeah. placate him. He might have a gun in his briefcase. Who knows? So they're like, sure, sure, sure. So I, I turned my back to them, censoring myself very dramatically. And I turned around and they just said, <laughs> And they just died laughing. I mean, Scott Rudin and the director. Uh, and they just said, right then, which is very rare, you've got the pot. Oh. And just like, oh, yeah. wow. No, she just said, you know, she was a go for it. You know, she like, really encouraged me, which ended up, if you see you see that my fingers are about halfway into her cheek, I was so geeked up. And she came the next day, she had broken corpuscles all over her face. Wow. So I learned the lesson, do not screw up your lead lady and your movies fixed. <laughs> <laughs> She was a real sport about it. No, 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 no. She, she said go for it. She was, she's the sweetest lady I've ever heard. No, she didn't complain, but I learned the lesson because you can't have her, you know, they had to make, cover her face in makeup and I screwed up her face. Wow. So I learned a, a, once again a valuable lesson. So tell me, did you guys have any familiarity? Did you read uh, the short story before auditioning before you filmed? No. Have you read it since? No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I read it, and you know my character wasn't that, that big in it, so I just you know went went on and developed my character from there. But I really liked the ending that was way more gnarly with them on the crosses and the courthouse in their eyes and stuff. I was like, that should be the end. But of course, I'm not a Hollywood guy. So. Yeah. <laughs> did, did I read it? I don't read. It. Uh, no, actually I did read it. Uh, to know the literature on which you were going to make a film, you have to know what the thoughts were and so forth. But the sad part about it was that the script was originally purchased or written from the novella with Stephen King and was owned by... Um, uh, Roach. Yeah, Hal Roach, the man who started Little Rascal. The idea being this would be a series to bring back or a show to bring back the Little Rascals. But it didn't seem to go over very well with Hollywood leadership. So New World acquired it with a syndicate of financiers and hired another writer to turn it into the story we had. But the story itself was too close to the novella. So uh, I remember sitting with uh, the studio executive who had a pair of um, 
um, shears, uh, scissors that you cut cloth with, you know, these things are like 18 inches long, and he would just chop out pages, and we paste some of the remnants back together, and that became the script, and then some interstitial material was written. So there was a lot of work done because of cost and resource availability and staying within a financial parameter, which is the way these kind of films are made. You get a bag of money, we don't care. Don't go over the bag of money, spend what you have. Yeah. So you make it up like you said. How many things? I was a huge Stephen King fan back in high school in good old blue eyes in Illinois. So, uh, we would like pass around a dog ears beat up paperback copy of Carrie to different friends. You gotta read this, is so cool. Uh, and then again, I you know, bought when Night Shift came out, I bought the, you know, started my all the Stephen King books and hardback. And then so when I got the audition, which was just a few weeks after I moved to LA, which was amazing timing, um, I had the book there. But again, just like Isaac wasn't as big of a character and there wasn't the same dialogue, but you got an idea. So, but I always loved Stephen King, he's a genius. Aside from Children of the Corn, do you have a favorite Stephen King novel? Because um, Shawshank Redemption is just brilliant. It's really wonderful. This is for Franklin. Um, when you, were you excited when you got to um, go back and do the sixth installment? Yes, yes, I mean, it, it, we pitched it, and again, they said, you know, no brain, and we need some have more ideas. But it was so cool because, I mean, the first one, I didn't obviously write that dialogue, so it was really cool to be able to write. And my favorite line is when I say to the Dr. Stacy Keach, she says, I have no soul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it was a really exciting experience. To tag on to what you were just saying about the script writing, did you feel any stress or pressure at all of wanting to match the theme and the dialogue of what existed, or were you just, I'm writing my piece? No, uh, interesting question. My writing partner and I watched two, three, four, five, and we didn't really think like any of them that much. So we just said, let's go from the first, which is a classic, just Isaac was in a coma for 18 years, whatever. <laughs> and then just go from there and then have uh, his wife's character, Rachel, grown up, she was Nancy Allen, and then she had a daughter, and go, go watch it, it's, it's really cool. Um, so, but again, it's just you know, low budget, and we we're in a location which was used a lot, actually the same hospital uh, that we shot, like the grand ending, was also, I was in another film with uh, Denise Richards and Paul Walker, Paul Tammy and the Teenage T-Rex, so we shot that there too, so it's like always being used in LA location. But also the, the, you know, the, some of the crew members uh, said, we are losing this location in two hours. And if we stay here longer, we have to go into overtime with the crew and blah, blah, blah. So actually the director, my right partner wasn't there because it was like two in the morning or whatever. So Kyra Stodden, the director, uh, Paul, who played He Who Walks Behind the Rose, and I rewrote the ending to become like this game show thing, and then we just, it was boom, and shot an hour, and then we were done, and that was the final wow. shot. Wow. What do you think of Children of the Corn? <laughs> I have a question for Chris. I, I know, or maybe John knows, anybody knows this. Did, is, was there ever something to do with Stephen King that Stephen King doesn't feel good about Children of the Corn for some reason? I don't know what it is, but I heard a rumor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's Okay, so. <laughs> All fans here. I mean, look, yeah. Guy's got a pen, piece of paper, he thinks he can write. So. <laughs> When we finished the film, we expected some kind of feedback. But since he was part of the original script that did not sell and could not sell, there's a strong animosity. And I completely understand it. So his uh, note to the studio was one of, um, he just was not in favor of the, the result of the film. His work was not translated, was not brought to the screen the way he intended the film to be. I think. So I saw a note uh, that was not complimentary, and then I never 
saw anything else or heard anything else from him other than recently in some of the polls about his work being filmed, he rated our film pretty highly in the scale of all the Stephen King's work, which is nice. But I did, in Pennsylvania, um, I saw his name on a poster in a bookstore signing books. This was about three years ago. So I rushed to this post store on Monday morning to go and meet him to say, I'm the guy. Let's talk, you know, let's, you know, let's bury the hatchet. And the poster was behind a book. And when they moved the book, uh, he was there two years earlier. So <laughs> I had to donate I by one chance to talk to him. So, does he get a percentage of all the children of the foreign movies that have been made, the franchise? That I don't know. I know he, I get reports still. I had to fight for the financial reports because we were promised certain participation from all the different owners of the film. And now Disney owns the film and they're very difficult to deal with. His um, deferred payments continue to get paid. I know that. Wow. And he, he's picked up a lot of money from that film. Wow. You know, probably a million dollars. Wow. Over wow. the aggregate, over, as an aggregate sum. The rest, no one else got the money. He was paid there. At some point, I don't remember it was, but I bought it. It's called Stephen King at the Movies, and it's him interviewing and talking about each of the films. And in it, he said that he didn't care for children of porn, but he said that very nicely, I'm sure all the actors that did a good job have gone on to do better movies. <laughs> Well, he said, 40 years later. <laughs> well, he said, you know, when it came out, he wasn't in favor of it. He's had 40 years of, of movies of adaptations to realize that this one wasn't that bad. <laughs> I believe he held the rights to the name, Children of Porn. So that's his intellectual property. What that intellectual property is varies film to film. So he must be paid a royalty or an actual licensing film from every producer for that, and it's probably in a couple hundred thousand dollar range. Um, it's really, it's not, it's modest, but it's still 10 times that. It's done wow. very well. Wow. I mean, it's cool to be part of a film 40 years March this year. Uh, we were at the court of fields. Uh, and keep walking, keep walking. You <laughs> <laughs> gotta say cut. Just go. <laughs> now you talked about the challenges of filming. What were some of you know the biggest delights? Delight, delight. If there were any. The delight at that time for my first film ever was something called Per Diem, which I'd never heard of. <laughs> Did you I gamble it all the way? <laughs> oh, I, I didn't gamble. I was I only came to I was only there for two weeks. And I was researching this other movie and I, I took my per diem and go to the mall, because there was a mall. And just spend it every day. Oh, I would buy like leather jackets I didn't need, cowboy hats. And I remember like those guys on the set who had been making movies all their lives were like, don't spend all your deal, bro. And I'm like, why not? You know, like I, I, they give it to me every day and I'm like, just go spend it. And they're like, you think that's going to come for the rest of your life? I'm like, yeah. I just thought, like, this is my life from now on. That was a joy. That's just the naivete of that was just like, oh, um, wonderful. But you were supposed to spend that on food. You were supposed to eat food. I try to go to the set, like, is there any food? Like, where's your pants, man? Oh, I spent it on this jacket I'll never wear. Well, you could always say, you know, hey, I had a few tacos, I was on a diet. Yeah, I wasn't eating, yeah, Chris, because of the six-pack. Oh, yeah. I can't, I gotta say this. Flash dancing come out, and when I'm walking into the cornfield, that we had a wardrobe person saying, "Okay, shirts like." I go, "No, no, no, my shirt is down here." No, no, it's continuity. Your shirt's up here. And I'm like, nope. Ah. It's down here on my shoulder, down where the flash dance lady had. <laughs> that, that was fun too. <coughs> what a feeling! What a feeling! <laughs> It's going to sound smalty, but meeting Courtney and being friends with him still, like 41 years later, and John Philbin. Um, Courtney and I just hung out in LA. He came to my house for Thanksgiving. I mean, we just through the years have always been kept in touch. Um, I wrote a pilot for us that Courtney got the whole crew together. Uh, it's called Horrified, and it's about sort of 
us going to horror conventions. We shot like a sizzle reel eight minute, and it was so much fun just to keep in contact with him and, and working with him. And, and he got me in with our manager to do all these conventions. And then I put a good word in. Okay. <laughs> 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 and then he created a family. Yeah, don't look at me, look at this. No, oh, that's the guy. He's all together. <laughs> No, we, I think everyone, it was their first film. It was my first film. Um, everyone had this unbelievable enthusiasm because it was an opportunity that we were all eager to jump into and take. So the, the work ethic was phenomenal. It was, we can do this. There's nothing that says no. And I think we just plunged through it without a sense of, of failure. And we were going to make it work. And I know we continue to shoot portions um, insert shots they're called, and little close-ups in Los Angeles. Um, I know I stole some film and went out on the weekend to shoot additional film and then paid for it myself because we needed more shots. So there was nothing we couldn't do, and I think that's the cool part about, you call it the family. Yeah. You know, there's loyalty and there's dedication. You really learn a lot. Right? Something about that cornfield is interesting. That Phil then brought that up. There was something about that cornfield that was um, powerful. And um, when, when we go on that set, that's to me where the magic happened the most. Like, we feel the energy. Uh, I, I, they talk, they talk an accurate expression called when the muse comes, when like, something comes through you. It happened to me every time I was in that cornfield. And uh, I don't know what it was about that place, but there was something happening. So that was where the fun for me was with those things. So to wrap us up, I want to ask you guys, what is something important you have learned on a set? Doesn't have to be Children of the Corn, any set. That's a stupid question. <laughs> Sorry. That was a good question. That was a good question. Because it's hard to answer. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, you know, I, I, I like the stuff. I can go. Honestly, the thing I learned the most is that making films is dangerous. Nobody ever talks about it, but it is. Like, if you're riding a horse, it I've seen people get hurt. I've seen crazy things happen. I've jumped into rivers with clothes on, thinking I was, it was fine. And then when I hit that water, I realized jeans are heavy, and I'm swimming for my life, you know? So you really have to pay attention when you're on the set. Um, it's easy to hit something. I've, I've seen all kinds of crazy stuff happen. And, uh, so you just have to be aware, because there's a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of people, a lot of equipment, and you're shooting late at night, and you're getting tired, and uh, I'm just knock on wood, there isn't any, so I'll knock on my head, that I've survived this long. <laughs> that's true, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I'll say this, um, on a kind of global answer, after finishing that film, that, again, my first film, and then I wanted to make more films, Tough Turk, almost right away, and some other cool films. I started to get letters once the film came out from people from around the world. And one, I mean, I would get them, one came to me, I would say a year after making the film, and it was addressed Fritz Kirsch, director, USA. So somehow from the post office, went to the director's guild, who then, as a member, sent it to me. And I opened it, and it was red ink, written in a spiral, a continuous sentence that just, got bigger and bigger about how much they enjoyed the slaughtering and killing of adults and all this kind of thing. And it literally leapt out of my hands. I thought, oh my God, this is wacky. I, you know, this, is, this is not for me. This is, what have I done? You know? And so my point is that we have a huge responsibility to provide information and to influence a viewer in the correct way. So that which we deal with, the voice of our products, must be in a good, beneficial way. You cannot go out and tell people through film to do harmful things. At that point, I realized I can't do any of these things that are harmful. I have to now make the films with a perspective of benefit. So everything that we do and all the TV programming we watch and now all the media we learn is always manipulated and we have to think, why is this being told to me? So that, I think, you know, when I made this, this film at what, age 30 or something, I'm really 19, um, it just opened my eyes to a bigger problem we have. 
as, uh, as people who have voice. Uh, wow. And uh, along those lines, I learned on Return of the Living Dead that after we did the cemetery scene where Trash takes off her clothes, it starts to rain. And the rest of the film takes place after we're caught in the rain. <laughs> but if you're an actor and you read a script, <laughs> and, it, it, and it rains before you have to cross a river or jump in the ocean in the first part of the screenplay, and then it goes into night. If you will be wet down by a PA with a hose before every take of every scene for the duration of the production. And that, that PA is, that's the only good part of their job. <laughs> Bouncing off of what Courtney said about how dangerous it is, before I got children with porn, my agent said, well, you know, you're, you're short and someday your face is gonna fall, you won't look young anymore. Uh, so maybe you could do stunt double work. Um, Okay, I'll get some experience on the set. So there was a small older man in a TV movie called Dead Man's Folly. And it, he had already gone back to England or whatever. So they said, we're gonna put a great wig on you. We're gonna sit on this pier in the Warner Brothers back lot with a lake. And this, uh, this guy in a scuba suit gonna come up and grab you and pull you down under the water. And it was, it was freezing. It was, they did not heat this. And so they, every time, and they had a whistle, so because the scuba guy couldn't hear but, and so he would hold me down under water for whatever until they said cut. And one time, like the third take, I hear the whistle and he's still holding me and he's at the oxygen tank and we're underwater and I just elbowed his face. I said, and he's like, whoa, as he let me up. And after that, I told my agent, no more stunt doubles. <laughs> Tell about Adam's family when there was like a fire on the set. Oh and to cut you out in the outfit. Do we have time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. okay. It's a good okay. story. Okay. So Adam's family, actually, as cousin did, uh, and I was allergic to hairspray, so they had to spray the suit with like this oil-based lanolin stuff, and they had a guy from the company that built the suit. They called him my handler. So in between takes, it was. Uh, like a scuba sized mask, they clip back the hair so I could actually breathe. I had a battery powered fan, my like regular would come up with like a gerbil bottle with water. <laughs> no arms. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so I go through gallons of water, a beautiful collection, collection that time. Uh, but all of a sudden, we were, back in the day, really big lights up there. We were shooting the big ballroom scene with, you know, 50 extras. And, and dancing around, and um, and all of a sudden, one of the lights pop and burst into flames. And so suddenly, and I'm like, the hair is, it happened during a take, and I had no way that I could run away. This is a 60, a 34, five pound uh, costume, and this woman, a guardian angel, she grabbed me and pulled me aside, otherwise I would have been killed in a stampede, and I'd never know who she was, uh, whether she was a business angel, but she saved my life. It's like the fire, and every all the extras were like, running out of the, the sound stage. And, but it was very, very dangerous. Yeah, they just the left. Yeah. Yeah. Dangerous. <laughs> we almost lost you. <laughs> and with that oil base, I went whoosh. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you did it because it wouldn't have children of the corn 666. All right. All right. Everyone, please give it up. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, I appreciate you guys. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah.